I'm going to really try to focus on. Um, one of the uh, forms of suffering uh, that people experience, both individuals with these, uh, this condition as well as their family and caregiver, um, uh, is actually ethical distress. They're, they're facing these issues at these different phases that we just spoke about. And they don't have anybody that helps them sort it out. Uh, is, is using deception a good thing to be doing? Is it my loving life if I'm doing that? And um, uh, so, uh, so these are ethical issues. But then what about the spiritual issues? And, uh, and to see how those issues actually change as people journey through these stages. And in the analysis, uh, these uh, tend to be overlooked or underemphasized. But in fact, I think these are the core issues. And that's, I think, what we're going to try to unpack. And that's something that this group uh, put its minds together to try to just articulate what those issues would be. Now, this is a, a slide to, uh, uh, that somebody else came up with, um, just listing the types of ethical issues that people encounter. And this list is not complete. So there are many things that people are struggling with. And as we talk about those case scenarios, I'm sure a number of them uh, uh, you will recognize and identify. Actually, when it comes to teaching medical people about uh, ethics, that's the most important step, just to recognize, to be sensitive that this is an issue, to see the power of issues, and to just identify it. And so this is not a small task to just have a, uh, a sensitivity to seeing these things. But there's also a number of spiritual issues, and I would say that these are even less likely to be identified. And, um, and it's this sort of thing that um, uh, we feel that um, kind of a Catholic Christian perspective can bring to this issue that is quite unique and quite needed. Now, all these ethical and spiritual issues, uh, when we got together this cloak, we knew that there's no way we can kind of um, uh, get them all. And so what we decided to do is to try to identify what are the fundamental issues at stake here, and uh, to try to articulate them in some kind of a framework that people could bring to each of these particular issues that would be helpful and practical. And, um, and that's not an easy task to do in a short time. We only had uh, four days together. But uh, to identify what those four things are, and then to just try to uh, begin to unpack a certain approach to even thinking about these issues. So here are some of the things that uh, the group came up with. And I guess the, the two comments I would make, and I'll, I'll go into some of these issues in a bit more detail, but um, one of the things that was um, a bit novel about this get-together was we tried to formulate these issues uh, in the language of the world, first of all. Uh, we called it philosophical language. And, and just try to articulate what we think about uh, why this is still a person. Why that guy is wrong to say this is not my father anymore. And how do you say that in a way that is, uh, would engage someone with no sort of uh, religious perspective on these issues at all? But we also articulated the same thing, uh, I think elaborated and deepened it, in explicitly theological language, drawing on the tradition. And, um, and that's also very helpful to see, because the, the folks that uh, would find this document useful are engaged in both worlds. And they actually need to have both uh, ways of articulating these issues. And I think on a, on a personal level, uh, the convincing arguments are actually not the philosophical ones. It's the faith commitment. That's why they're, they're doing what they're doing. The other thing that we did that was, I think, novel this time is we tried to identify and in some cases articulate the best position that was radically opposed to what we're calling our foundation.
foundational positions. So, for instance, the, uh, the best articulation of why this is no longer a person. Who said that? And what are they saying? Let's look at that. And, uh, and because really, uh, the position that, I'm, that this group is articulating in the broader range of positions uh, is, I, is not the dominant view. So it's important for us to understand what the, the dominant voices that are capturing people's minds and hearts are and, and to actually critique them. So I'll start with this one because um, this is at the core of the whole state, this understanding of uh, what we call intrinsic dignity and identity of the human person. And uh, as, as we stated, and this is paraphrased, but the loss of intellectual and other cognitive abilities do not undermine the identity of those living with PCI as human beings and members of the human family. They continue to have dignity and worth and they, to be persons with moral status. So this is sort of the philosophical attempt to respond to Dr. S's son, who says, this isn't my father anymore. And the theological, and you'll see this in the statement that uh, is available, that the theological language of saying the same thing uh, would be to uh, speak about a Catholic understanding of dignity based on God's love for us and call to communion um, and uh, to unpack it in those terms. Now, that's what we would call a foundation. And uh, to, make, to, to make the link between something very basic and uh, a practical, helpful recommendation we try to make them into more of a, um, a, an action statement uh, called a principle, and, uh, and then to articulate uh, recommendations, concrete recommendations that would follow from that principle. So uh, there's an articulation of uh, respect for intrinsic dignity, that, um, that that's what it's called for um, encouraging inclusion participation. That's part of what it means to respect dignity and to be person and family centered in, in providing care. So these, these are ways of, of kind of spelling out a bit more broadly what intrinsic dignity actually means. And then specific recommendations um, uh, and things like the important language and attitude and behaviors that the I would stigmatize. And to be very careful about these things to be aware of um, uh, to protect people from neglect and abuse, um, that people should be made to feel as though they're a burden to others, or as uh, a famous person in the UK uh, in the Warren Commission said, have a duty to die. Uh, that uh, if safety is a concern, uh, a recommendation with this view of dignity to do the least intrusive and restrictive options first, to approach these things uh, in, in, in that kind of a manner. And um, encourage and support participation in distinct decision making to the extent that an individual is capable. Uh, and, and to see as part of that the importance of at those early discussions and uh, discussions about how to help the family with these end of life dilemmas. So you get the sense there's a big issue. The son thinks this guy doesn't, is no longer the same person. They've lost their both dignity and identity. We've rebutted that. And here's a philosophical way of saying it. Here's the theological uh, articulation of the same thing. Spell that out into some pretty broad principles and then made some very specific recommendations. They're still pretty broad, but uh, it's, this is where the rubber hits the road. If you believe in the dignity of the human person, even when so, uh, so affected by uh, a devastating condition such as this, then this is what it means. And so um, I'm mindful of the time, but we've done that for those other big foundational things. So the unity uh, of the human being, 
that we're not just a mind separated from a body, we're a unity. And to articulate that, and to also say that if we lose certain capacities, the men's, um, it doesn't entail that uh, there's a reduction in uh, the human person, um, that they're then only a biological entity and uh, deprived of uh, spiritual capacity. Um, and that would be a view held by um, uh, you know, very prominent uh, people. Um, Peter Singer comes to mind, the Peter Singer from Australia, um, to kind of claim that uh, when this happened, uh, all that's left is the biological. Um, and uh, for Catholic to articulate that uh, would draw on um, a notion of the unity of, uh, of the body and spirit. And, uh, and that, that that unity is actually what's at stake in these discussions. <clears throat> so, uh, following from that would be um, the, the principle that we promote care that is holistic. And it's holistic in the sense that it is uh, recognizing the individual as a composite. Um, and also that um, you may need people with different skills to be involved uh, appropriately in supporting uh, them in various ways. So, recommendations. Foster beautiful and stimulating environments. Music, art, dance, they're all good. And people need that. And, and it can make a huge difference to their quality of life. Uh, that's actually what this, uh, this group in uh, Germany was attempting to do, creating these environments where uh, it was very, uh, I guess, patient and family-centered. Um, and then ensure that spiritual care is offered and encourage parishes to develop structures to provide pastoral care. One example from the UK that people might have heard about are uh, something called um, Alzheimer's pubs or something. Um, but anyway, it was, it's meant to be a place where people can come together, both individuals that are affected as well as family members, and just and socialize, uh, but also uh, talk about ethical and spiritual issues. And, and in those gatherings, to have people with some expertise that can, can help them identify and, and strategize about what to do. And that's a parish initiative. Um, and then uh, the other thing is about the importance of educating, uh, particularly care providers, in, in this approach to care. Um, and in fact, the, the program that uh, originated in Sweden, Sylvia Hammer program, is, is called after, it's actually the, the sponsor of the whole program, is the Queen of uh, Sweden. Uh, it's a two-year program, certification program for primary care providers to sort of get them reoriented in how you care for people with dementia. So another big issue uh, is the recognition of the importance of human relationships. And uh, that people um, with cognitive impairments have the capacity uh, to receive care and love, even if their capacity during that phase of their life uh, to reciprocate is limited. And the other important side of this is the recognition of caregivers uh, being able to discover and express uh, a certain relation, relationality that is intrinsic to their humanity in serving and supporting people. In other words, they learn about love. And in fact, um, uh, that perspective on care is crucial. Uh, that there's a huge benefit to this, uh, which doesn't come out in a cost analysis. Um, and then uh, the community uh, can have a role in uh, sustaining Members and uh, supporting decision making. And in a sense, there is a very dominant uh, uh, emphasis in the West on individual autonomy. And a condition like this actually calls that view into question and acknowledges that we are all members of community and we have to support one another, um, particularly when uh, uh, faced with these sorts of conditions. 